the context that, that we are living in today is one in which, in all the history of humanity, we have never had more access to avenues of communication and news. Never. And yet, at the same time, never have we been less certain of what is actually and truthfully happening around the world. So whether by cable TV or satellite radio, conventional radio, WhatsApp, and myriad other online sources and websites, we are inundated with news more than we could ever meaningfully take in. And yet, I, I often find myself asking, what is really happening? What's really going on? Or maybe a better question is, who can I trust? Of all these news sources, which ones are actually trustworthy? Who can I believe? Just yesterday, a friend of mine and I were considering the fact that the phrase fake news that, that phrase, which has become so ubiquitous, we hear it everywhere. I'm guessing that you either read or hear that, that phrase multiple times every day. Until four years ago, it was not in common usage. Think about that. It was in November. I did a little bit of research. In November of 2016, that that phrase, fake news, became, it sort of exploded onto um, the worldwide media scene. Who do you trust about what is going on in the world? Today we're returning to our study of Acts after a nine-week break. We're still in the first couple chapters. And if you recall, the last sermon that I preached from Acts was on the arrival of the Holy Spirit. In fact, that was the title of the sermon, The Arrival. The Holy Spirit comes upon, falls upon approximately 120 disciples, men and women, and neither they nor the world have ever been the same. Remember the context. A loud, rushing wind, tongues of fire appearing above all their heads, and then they began to speak the wonders of God in other languages. And all the people who were visiting Jerusalem, and, and you can go back and look at the beginning of chapter 2 and see that list of Jews from all over the known world, all those people heard the message. They heard the wonders of God being proclaimed in their own language. Now, right away, false interpretations were proposed. Fake news, it might, the, the phrase might be new today, but the concept is as old at least as Pentecost. How does it start? These men are drunk. Logically, drunkenness is the only way to explain the fact that they can speak coherently in so many different languages and that everyone can hear them clearly. It, they must be drunk. Now, at that point, the 12 apostles come forward. Remember that Matthias was chosen to replace Judas Iscariot, so the number has been completed to 12 again for the purpose of witness, to be ready to witness to the truth of Christ. And the 12 apostles come forward, and then Peter steps out from among them to set the record straight. And he preaches the first sermon after the arrival of the Holy Spirit. We might say it was the first sermon of this new entity, the church. Today, I'd like us to look at the introduction to Peter's sermon. And I'm calling this introduction setting the scene because that's what Peter is doing for his listeners. Because these people to whom he's preaching, they have either seen, heard, or heard about what has just happened. The rushing wind, the tongues of fire, the multiple languages being spoken or the multiple languages being understood. And as Peter sets the scene in this introduction for the rest of his sermon, he's going to answer four questions that we will uh, answer along with him today. He's going to answer the question, when? In other words, he's going to locate these events in salvation history. Secondly, he's going to answer the question, who? Who are the main actors? Who are the main characters involved? Thirdly, the question, what? What is actually happening? What did just happen? What is bringing about this, this speaking in tongues and these signs? And finally, he's going to answer the question, why? Why are these things happening? What purpose are they to serve? So let's follow along with Peter as we seek to understand the answer to these very same questions and understand that in answering these questions, he is preparing his audience 
for the body or the meat of his sermon. And I'm going to give you a little preview. The main point of Peter's sermon is the person and work of Jesus Christ. I don't think that should surprise any of you. So he's setting the scene to introduce these people to Jesus. I'll be reading from chapter 2 of Acts, beginning with verse 14, and I'll read through verse 21. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. <laughs> These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter begins with a little ironic humor. These men aren't drunk, it's only nine in the morning. Pause for laughter. Ha 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 ha. That's not what it is, but now let me tell you what this is really about. These remarkable events are prophecy coming true before your very eyes and ears. So Peter takes them back to the prophet Joel. And essentially he says to them, all these things that are, that are just now happening, these things that you're seeing and hearing, they're what Joel was talking about in his prophecy. They're what Joel was talking about when, he, when Joel wrote, in the last days. Remember I said that Peter was going to answer the question, when? When in salvation history are these events taking place? They're taking place in the last days. Whoa, whoa, just, just wait a second. Peter preached the sermon approximately 2,000 years ago, right? And he claimed that then... That moment, they were in the last days? Well, the world uh, seems to still be around. I mean, I'm here, you're here, or you're there, uh, and life goes on. Does that mean that, that we're not in the last days anymore? Or does it mean that Joel was wrong in his prophecy, or that Peter misinterpreted it? Not in the least. Because to us, the word last implies near the end. And that can be true. But remember also that Scripture is clear that God's perspective on time, and God's perspective on nearness, God's, in, God's perspective on how long a day lasts, those questions are different for God than for us. His perspective is very, very different. And the way that the prophets in general, and Luke in particular, define the last days is that they begin with the incarnation of Jesus. So when Jesus appears on earth, the last days have begun. The last days will end. They will reach their fulfillment when Jesus reappears, when he comes back. So Jesus' incarnation has ushered in the last days. And that means that we are living in the last days. It would seem from Scripture that we're living in the last era, if you want to put it that way, last era of history before the end of all things, before the return of Christ. Now, just because it's the last days doesn't mean that we know when they're going to end. More on that later. But for now, Peter anchors the events of Pentecost in prophecy, and the answer to the question, where, what, I'm sorry, when are these events occurring? The last days. The, the days of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So if this scene is set in the last days, who are the major players? Who are the main characters? In the last days, God. That's what verse 17 says. That's what Joel prophesied. That shouldn't surprise us again. 
God is not only the main character of Scripture, He is the creator, He is the initiator, He's the protagonist of all history. And by God, I mean the Godhead, the triune, three-person God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, together acting in full accord and perfectly united in love. And as Peter continues his sermon, we will see the, the action and interaction of all three members of the Trinity. But at this moment, Peter through Joel shows the Father is present, but also the Holy Spirit. But there are other characters as well, are there not? The phrase, all people, jumps out. Now, he refines that statement later on in verse 18, sorry, with the phrase, even on my servants. So when, when he you, you makes the statement, all people, that's a subset of all God's servants. So his spirit is being poured out on all people, all of his servants. Now, why is that an important statement? It's important because one of the greatest divisions at that point in history was between Jew and Gentile. And if we go back further to the dawn of time, to the fall of mankind, what is the original greatest schism between people that has plagued humanity and plagued the church from the very beginning? It's between men and women. What happened in the Garden of Eden? God says to Eve, because of your sin, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. That's not what God intended. That's not what God prescribed. But it's a result of sin that a sword would come between the genders. And here now, what's happening is that God is making this proclamation that in the last days, after the coming of his son, Jesus Christ, his spirit is going to be poured out on all all flesh and he is specific in who these people are going to be it's going to be the young it's going to be the old it's going to be sons it's going to be daughters and specifically both men and women in verse 18 we can already see the restorative narrative and the restorative power of the gospel to bring people who have been divided profoundly divided even at odds with each other, whether for, because of gender or whether because of race. And he is restoring them by his spirit. His spirit is poured out on all people. But for now, at this point, the question, who is all God's servants, young, old, men, women, Jew, Gentile? The church is the primary community in which racism can and should be put to death once and for all. I, I know that... that a good part of our world is currently in, in flames, literally, over this question of racism. And it's something we, we need to address within the church uh, because it's the primary community, perhaps I would say the only community, um, in which racism can truly be put to death once and for all. But we're going to talk about that later because Acts addresses these issues very, very, very bluntly, actually, as Jewish Christians learn what it means that they are now brothers and sisters with Gentiles, people that they had despised and hated for all of their existence. So we have all God's servants <clears throat> as actors in these last days, and we have God himself and his spirit. So we move on to the third question, the question, what? What? What is actually happening? We, Peter's listeners now know that these events that are anchored in the last days, and they know that the primary characters involved are God, His Spirit, and His people. But what is it exactly that's happening? Well, we've already read it, and you've heard me reference it. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. And the clear implication is that the Spirit of God is the catalyst for these events. He is the one making this stuff happen. The wind, the tongues of fire, the proclamation of the wonders of God in many languages, it's all the work of the Holy Spirit. He has now come upon the church. And there's something else to consider here as well, though. Along with the pouring out of the Spirit, there are some other events that Joel describes, are there not? 
things that are going to happen or have happened in the last days. Look at verses 19 through 20. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. That great and glorious day of the Lord, that's the return of Christ. That's what we're looking toward, the fulfillment of the last days. But as you read those descriptions there in Joel, we realize there are some really terrifying events that are going to happen. Now, remember this context, Jerusalem. That's where Peter's preaching. Approximately 40 days after Jesus' death. We don't know exactly how many days, approximately 40, 40 to 50 days. What happened in Jerusalem when Jesus died? Joe read it for us this morning from Matthew. If we take all the gospel accounts together, we know that there were severe earthquakes, stones torn apart. We know that in the middle of the day, the sky turned black. The sun was darkened as though it were night. And I don't know about you, but what Matthew describes is pretty freaky. Tombs of holy people split open and they walked around the city. And they appeared to many people. So many of these people that are listening to Peter had witnessed those signs. They had seen these, some of these things or things like this happening. The sun turning dark, earthquakes, shaking, shattering, strange events, fearful events. And since Peter's drawing on this prophecy, he's saying to the people, that is now. This is now. What Joel was prophesying about is here. It has come. The time is now. They were living it, and we are living it. The Holy Spirit poured out upon the church. And along with the prophetic voice that comes with the presence of the Holy Spirit are also going to be these signs that show us, that remind us, that, that call for us to wake up to remember that we are in the last days. Now the final question <clears throat> that Peter answers here is the question, why? Why are these things happening? Why is the Holy Spirit poured out on his church? What's the purpose? He sets the scene and concludes by pointing to the reason for which all these things are happening. Why did these signs appear at the death of Christ? Why did God pour out his spirit on the disciples? What was his intended purpose? Well, to understand that, I think we just need to see what happens when the Holy Spirit comes. What is the response? I know we're still early on in the book of Acts, but I, I do hope that you've already picked up the theme of witness, witness, witness. It's why the disciples felt compelled to replace Judas Iscariot with Matthias, that the number of witnesses to the truth of Jesus would be complete. When the Holy Spirit is given to the disciples, what do they do? We talked about this 10 weeks ago. Immediately, they begin proclaiming the wonders of God. And that proclamation is done in such a way by the power of the Holy Spirit that it's accessible to all the people who were present. They could hear and understand in their own language. In Joel's prophecy here in the second part of chapter 2 of Acts, what do the old and the young, the sons and daughters, the men and women, the Jews and the Gentiles, what do they do when the Holy Spirit is poured out on them? They prophesy. Remember that biblically speaking, prophecy is not primarily about foretelling the future. That can be an aspect of prophecy. But in Scripture, that's never where the focus lies. Prophecy is the speaking of the truth of the Word of God into a specific circumstance to specific listeners. It is witness to Christ and His gospel. To make this point clear, Peter ends his introduction with Joel's words, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The impetus, the empowerment of the presence of the Spirit, 
is to witness. That's the primary work that the Holy Spirit does in the church. It's not the only work. It's not the only activity in which the Holy Spirit is involved. We know this from Scripture, but it is one of the primary ones, and it's the theme, one of the themes of the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit fills the church with the motivation, power, and impetus to witness to those who need to be saved, to be the voice and example of God Himself on earth. And that is a high and honorable calling. Now remember, Peter's use of Joel's prophecy is the introduction to his sermon. So he's inspired to speak by the Holy Spirit, to preach the truth of God for salvation, and he ends his introduction with the perfect setup. What is it? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, for the rest of his sermon, Peter is going to talk about that name. He's going to talk about that person. You see, for the Jews at that time, the name of the Lord... His name, remember, Lord written all in capitals? His name is Yahweh. But now in Christ, God has revealed himself to the Jews and to the Gentiles, to all humanity, in a new way. It's not a new God, but he has revealed himself in a new way. He has revealed himself as Emmanuel, God with his people. In the coming of the Holy Spirit, he has revealed himself as God within his people, dwelling within his church, living within the very bodies of believers, of his children. And Peter is now going to present Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, to the crowd. But he's going to present him as the Son of God. Later on in Acts, in chapter 4, Peter is going to be preaching again. He does this often in the early chapters of Acts. And he's going to make the famous statement, which perhaps many of you know, a statement about Jesus, that there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So he sets his audience up to be introduced to the name of Jesus by which they can, they may be saved. I think we can all agree that these events and this sermon that Peter preaches were impacting and powerful in ancient Jerusalem. In case you don't know this, over 3,000 people converted to Christianity. In other words, accepted Christ's sacrifice and his identity as their savior on that day. We'll get to that at the end of of Peter's sermon. But what about today? What is the impact of this introduction, of this fulfillment of Joel's prophecy for us today? if, If the last days began with Christ's appearing and will end at his return, that's what Joel meant by the phrase, the day of the Lord, are we not also still living in the last days? And has not the Spirit been given to the children and church of God in these last days? So isn't Joel's prophecy still being fulfilled? Isn't the Spirit of God inspiring witness to the saving truth of Jesus Christ? Does not every child of God, young and old, woman or man, Jew or Gentile, still have the high calling, empowered by the Spirit, to speak the wonders of God? In short, to witness. The answer to that is yes, we do. I know, I know it can be uncomfortable to consistently witness to the truth of Christ. That's that's true for every believer. There, there are moments where we have an opportunity, we have an opening, and, and it's, it's, it's fearful perhaps, it's uncomfortable. We don't want to be disliked, we don't want to be misunderstood, we don't want to be perceived as a Bible thumper, we don't want to be the, the killjoy, the one who's always walking around, uh, somehow making people feel guilty for how they're acting. So there are times, I think, for many of us, where we let those opportunities kind of slide by, Now, in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, 
Uh, Paul writes a, just a, a very brief instruction to the Thessalonian church, and he says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Now, if you were raised on the King James Version, you would have learned that as do not quench the Spirit, or quench not the Spirit, if we really want to get it correctly. Um, quench not the Spirit. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. Uh, I think there are many ways that, that children of God can quench the Spirit or deny the Spirit's power, can put out the Spirit's fire. But I would suggest this morning that perhaps one of the major ones is by refusing to do what the Holy Spirit is empowering us to do, which is to be witnesses for Christ, to be witnesses of the truth of the gospel. What he has done in and for us to share that with those with whom we come in contact. Another application here is, is that we live in, in fearful times. Every generation has thought this. Uh, every generation since Jesus has believed that their generation would be the last, or at least a good portion of that generation has believed that the great and terrible day of the Lord would come during their lifetime. And why would they think that? Because they would look around at the world and they would see horrible things happening. Not only natural disasters, but they would see wars and rumors of wars, famine, people dying, plagues, suffering, perversion, evil. Those who were listening to Peter speak, many of them probably would, would still have been alive when Jerusalem was completely um, invaded and, and the temple destroyed in 70 AD. I'm certain that people who saw that thought, this is the end. The temple of God has been destroyed. How can things get any worse? How could evil um, grow any further? I think every successive generation has seen that. We've seen genocides. Genocides not only in Africa, but many places around the world. Pogroms in Russia, World War I, World War II, slavery. Uh, history has been filled with awful, fearful events. And Joel's prophecy acknowledges those events. But he ends with what? The hope of salvation. Yeah, these things are going to happen. You're going to suffer. You're going to see these signs that you're in the last days. But the hope remains of the salvation of the children of God through Jesus Christ. Now, how about today? We're in the last days and we live in fearful times. I mean, if you spend 15 minutes a day perusing the internet or Facebook, or Twitter, or Instagram, you are going to see more evidence than you would like to see of the perversion of humanity, of the evil that infests our, our world, of disunity, of hatred, of lies, of war, of oppression, of suffering, and, and perversion of the human identity, perversion of the human soul, who God made people to be, how that's being so perverted. And we look around, and I'll be honest, I look and I say, how can things get worse, Lord? How can things get more perverted? How could evil grow any more than in this current situation? And it may not. You know, this may be, our generation may be the last one. But the point is not we're the last one. The point is that the hope of salvation is still extended. Just as it was in Joel's prophecy, just as it was in Jerusalem as Peter was preaching, so today in Sao Paulo, Brazil, or wherever you may be, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yes, all these horrible things are happening. Yes, the world is being torn apart. Yes, COVID is a real thing and it's killing people. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We may not be saved from the coronavirus. We may not be saved from war. We may not be saved from torment. We may not be saved from suffering. In fact, Scripture promises the disciples of Christ that we will suffer in this world. But we will be saved from the destruction of our souls, the destruction of our identity. We'll be saved from eternal separation from God. And that is a joyful message. So as the Holy Spirit has poured, been poured out on the church of God, 
we have both the responsibility and the privilege to be witnesses for Christ in a dark world, in an oftentimes terrifying world. And that, that world is trying to silence us. More and more, it's trying to silence us and it's trying to, as Paul says in Romans, conform us to the pattern of the world. Whereas the Holy Spirit is working to strengthen our voice, to strengthen our witness, to empower the light of Christ in and through us to a dying world. I just want to close uh, by speaking to those of you who may not yet be children of God. Now, that, that statement might be a little shocking to some of you because you may have heard, you know, we're all children of God or all people are children of God, but they're not. The children of God are those who have believed in Jesus Christ. That means that they have acknowledged that they are sinful, that they are inherently, that, they're, that they are born with evil in their hearts, that they didn't have to be taught to be bad, <laughs> that evil and sin are something we're born with, and they realize that and acknowledge that they can never be perfect, never, on their own strength. So they need the work of someone else, and that person is Jesus Christ. So a child of God is someone who has acknowledged their sin, who has repented of their sinfulness, and has accepted that Jesus is the Savior, that His death on the cross paid for their sins. And they have given their life to Him, and they have acknowledged His Lordship, and they belong to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a child of God. And all children of God can rest secure in this last phrase, of Joel's prophecy, that all who have called on the name of the Lord will be saved. May we become evermore, as a church community, one that is known for its witness. Our vision, part of our vision, a main point of our vision is disciple making. That we would both multiply believers and then multiply disciples. That's what this is about. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing in and through the church of God. May we be open to his work. May, may he multiply his work through us. Lord, please bring many new souls to you through your people at Calvary International Church. This